Okay. <laughs> All right. So we are now live and um, this is a joint meeting of the Senate and House Government Operations Committee along with some other folks. And we have a lot of people here with us today. Um, so um, do you, I guess to set the stage a little bit here, Sarah, is that okay if I just jump okay. in? Thank you. So we, we passed um, one of the very first pieces of legislation that we passed dealt with the um, upcoming elections because that's so important to us as a committee, as two committees, but also to um, our town clerks and our secretary of state and to all the voters in Vermont. And, and so we passed this very early giving the um, secretary of state and the, uh, where there were a couple things. There was the no having to sign petitions for obvious reasons. And then the part about it that we're gonna hear about today was the um, giving the secretary of state with approval from the governor, the ability to make whatever uh, changes we were felt necessary so that we could make sure that this election was gave everybody the opportunity to vote, but also protected people's health. And um, we know how crowded um, polls can get. I know in Brattleboro that they have the, they're set up and you're pushing each other in the shoulders and standing in line. And so we wanted to make sure that the options were there for the Secretary of State. Um, so what we are, have done a couple times, and this is the I think the third time we've had an update on where where that is they're kind of different there's the municipal elections and there's the primary and the general election so we're looking at all of those um i think it's important to understand that we're getting an update here we're not we don't have to give any kind of approval because we already gave the approval for the secretary and the state to secretary of state and the governor to um come up with options and there were a number of options that were listed so, um, Sarah, do you have anything to add here? And should we, and then we can jump to um, Will or Chris or whoever would like to start. Thank you. I appreciate the Deputy Secretary and the Director of Elections um, taking time to to brief us today. I think um, I think part of the real value of uh, of this conversation is in uh, helping <coughs> House and Senate members to understand what planning is being done. Uh, to be able to ensure that people can safely access the ballot box in, um, in August and in November, and also giving us an opportunity to, um, to become familiar with what, uh, what the changes are so that when our constituents and our town clerks ask us questions, we uh, can, uh, keep them apprised of what the plan is. So thank you so much for being with us today. And I think also to help inform our colleagues, because there are what 18 of us here today out of 180. So we need to be able to answer questions from our colleagues also because they will be having this uh, many of the same questions from their constituents and town clerks. So I don't know that um, my Betsy is with us. I don't know that she needs to <clears throat> walk through this at all or if we're all really familiar with what we, what we did. Does anybody have any um, technical questions for Betsy about what it was that we actually did? I don't see any hands. Do you, Sarah? Okay, if we, I don't see anybody raising their hands. So in that case, let's just then jump, I don't know. Will, if you want to start off, or if I see that Chris is with us also, um, I don't think Secretary Condos is, but if you would, however, the two of you want to start off, thank you. Sure, I don't, Chris, would you like to say anything before I start? No, I'm not seeing Chris. I think Chris might have just dropped off, did he? Take it, it away, Will. He has I, left. I had my. Okay. 
I'll, I'll go ahead and start and we'll get, he can he can join back in when he can. I thank you guys for having us here and I'm, I'm um, happy to give you an update on, on where we're at. And pardon me for um, working from notes today. I like to pride myself usually to be able to work off the top of my head, but there is too much in my head at the given moment to not rely on some notes. <clears throat> um, it's important to start by, by letting everyone know and making it clear that we haven't made any final decisions about our process for the 2020 elections in August and November. Uh, the, the primary reason for that is we need agreement with the governor um, and we are in the process of communicating with them and trying to reach that agreement, but that hasn't um, happened yet. And so we're still at the point where we really haven't made any final decisions and what I, what I talked to you about today could change. Um, then I wanna start with, and Senator White frankly mentioned the same thing, but both Secretary Condos and I have been approaching um, all of these discussions and the decisions we have to make in the 2020 elections um, with sort of two basic principles in mind, of course, which are protecting the health and safety of Vermonters primarily, that is the primary interest um, from this very highly contagious and highly deadly disease. Um, and at the same time, protecting their right to vote, which is a sacred, fundamental, critical right to our democracy. Um, and so it's really, a, a, it, it, it presents a significant challenge to all of us and to all Vermonters and to all Americans, frankly, to try and balance those two things um, going forward for the rest of the year and for the duration of the coronavirus, however long that might last. Um, so what, what I can tell you, what I'm gonna present to you today really is my recommendation as the director of elections as to how we can best accomplish those two goals in the 2020 elections for the rest of the year. Um, the two goals being health and safety of Vermonters and protecting their right to vote in what's a pretty critical upcoming general election. The recommendation that I've arrived at, I would say it's based on my expertise, my now eight years in the position um, administering these statewide elections. Most importantly, my conversations with town clerks, and city clerks and village clerks and school district clerks across the state. Um, they're gonna be the ones on the front line, the ones actually um, put in the position of having to conduct these elections, having to perform whatever process we decide on. Um, so their input's been critical and really helpful. Also dialogues with my colleagues across the country, uh, other election direct secretaries of state, um, their input has been essential as well. Um, there's about 50 people in the country who do the job I do and who know um, everything that comes with it and the kinds of decisions that I'm faced with. So that's another critical resource for me. And then input from um, advocates, various, various communities, advocacy communities and groups and researchers um, that have looked into the efficacy of various um, mail voting processes for a long time. But I think most importantly, and I'll get to the point, and, and I'm gonna try and be brief, I know everybody's on time crunches today, that um, I continually tried to step back and our team did remember that we wanna craft a solution that's appropriate for Vermont. Election administration is really different um, from state to state across the country. And so while all of that input is valuable, um, I also always operate from the, from the position that we have to do what makes sense in Vermont um, and not a cookie cutter approach that may work um, in another context. So um, with all of that said, I feel really strongly that the proposal we've come up with is the proposal that um, protects the health and safety of the poll workers and the voters as much as possible going forward this year. And I'll start from a high level where we, where we begin is that for the November general election, we intend to, I think that the best approach would be to mail a ballot to every active voter on our registered voter list. Uh, that mailing would come in late September. The deadline to send to military and overseas voters is middle of September. So this mailing would kick in right around that same time. And I've kind of thought of a, a no later date of October 1st to send ballots to all, of our, all active registered voters in Vermont. Um, they all would receive a prepaid pre-addressed return envelope, pre-addressed back to their individual clerk's office, and again, postage paid. 
The postage would also be paid on the envelopes going out to the voters from the clerk's office. And all of that postage will be paid at the state level through the federal funds that we've received um, for the Coronavirus Relief Cares Act. I would like to, this is, this is my ideal situation at this point, to have that mailing proceed on an opt-in basis for the clerks where they could opt in to having the state perform the mailing from a centralized mailing house. Um, I've heard a variety of opinions from clerks about that, and there are, there are positives and negatives to that. Um, <coughs> But I would say in general, most of the clerks have been um, excited to hear that that's an option, especially those in the bigger towns or cities, that the state could perform the mailing for them. And to be clear that the return cards, the return of the ballots would still go back to the clerks for the processing at the individual clerk's office, whether we mailed them out from the state or not, that's the current plan. Um, in addition, we would intend to mail a postcard to all of the challenge voters, I'll take a second to remind you all that distinction. Um, active voters are voters who are active on the checklist and in just a, a current status. What we in Vermont here call challenged voters are those that have been sent a notice um, because of some indication that their residence has changed, that they've either moved to another town in the state or they've moved out of state. And we've talked about this a lot in both committees. That's a process. Um, that's regulated by federal law. If you're gonna remove a voter from your checklist based on change of residency, you have to send a notice to those voters that gives them a chance to reply and say that um, you are, did I cut out? Are people still hearing me? Yeah, you're okay. Okay, to reply and say that you still live in the town, that would move you back into active status. If the clerk doesn't get a reply to that notice sent out, um, she has to, he or she has to wait two federal elections, so two November elections, without either getting a response or having that voter show up to vote, and then they can be removed from the list. That's federal law. So when I talk about the challenged voters, voters who have been sent that notice and we haven't heard back from or seen them vote yet. Um, the basic breakdown of that, I think the most, the, the most recent I looked at it, we have 480,000-ish total voters. 450,000 of those are active. Only 30 have received the notices and not taken action. That's actually a, a fairly small percentage relative to a lot of places, I think. Um, so those voters, the 30,000 or so, the challenged voters would receive a postcard that would allow them to affirm their residence, would have the same language that, has, that the standard response card has to those mailings, and would also give them a chance to request a ballot. That's the basic plan for November in terms of absentee balloting. I'll be clear here that um, I should have started with that. I think I mentioned to this to both committees last time I testified, we're triaging decisions, figuring out what decisions need to get made now, which can be delayed just as a matter of capacity and decision-making. Um, the ones that really need to be made now are the ones about how we're doing the early voting and the mailing of ballots back and forth. We will have further discussions and consideration based on the decisions we make now about what other kinds of processes we might need to put in, uh, namely polling place adjustments on election day. But more specific to this conversation, we will also need to figure out extended processing times for absentee ballots coming back, discussions about opening up, letting clerks use the tabulators for however long before the election and get ballots processed into tabulators and ballot boxes, whether we extend the processing and counting time beyond election day at all, whether we would extend the, the deadline to receive ballots back, go to a postmark system for November 3rd. Those are all decisions that will be made down the line after we've established this basic process. Um, the other thing that would obviously go along with mailing a ballot to every voter and mailing these postcards to the challenge vote would be a substantial voter education campaign put on by our office to let people know why they are receiving a ballot when they haven't requested it um, and how they both vote it and return it so that it gets counted by their clerk. That's gonna be a critical piece of the process. <laughs> Moving back to August, for a number of reasons, my proposal right now is that we proceed with a request-based absentee balloting process for the August election. So that is to say, essentially proceeding under current law in that regard. 
which would mean the voters need to request a ballot to have it sent to them and that the clerks would be the one doing that processing. <clears throat> so we're, we're gonna, again, even though we're not sending a ballot to all, we wouldn't, the proposal is to not send a ballot to all voters in June for the August primary. We would still equip clerks with enough absentee ballot envelopes to account for their entire checklist. They have to be the new envelopes that we're designing now with the postage paid metering on them that comes back to the state. So we'd equip them with an abnormal number of ballots as well. We're gonna print more ballots for the primary than usual and a, a equal number of absentee ballot envelopes that would account essentially for them being able to do that for everybody on their checklist. I don't expect that we will have 100% early voting in August, but we're gonna account for that. Um, because we're, we're just proceeding with the request-based process for the absentee balloting for August, we would intend to send a postcard this time to all of the active voters, the 450,000, sometime in mid-June. That postcard will lay out on the top all of the various ways that you can request a ballot in Vermont. Uh, we've noted as we go along that Vermont's really well positioned, especially relative to other states, due to the good work of these committees over the past four years. Um, the voters have many ways to request a ballot online, by phone, in person. Um, and you don't need an excuse to request that ballot and you can do so for 45 days before the election and you can do so in frankly all year. So they can put in, put in requests right now um, and get the ballot sent to them on the 45th day before the election. So the top half of the postcard would explain all those various ways to request the ballot. And then we would include a tear off mail in bottom of the postcard that is an absentee ballot request that's important for all the Vermonters that may not have access to online systems and or phones um, to call their clerks and for whom mailing a postcard back pre-addressed, prepaid again to the clerk's office would be the easiest option to submit their request. The point there obvious is obviously is since we're not mailing a ballot and putting that under your nose with a return, we're gonna make it as easy as possible for you to request the ballot in August. At the same time, we'd send up the same kind of postcard that I talked about for the general election to the 30,000 challenge voters that allows them to both affirm um, their residence and request a ballot at the same time. I can get into some of the reasoning. I sure, I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna field questions that would, that would prompt these answers, but that postcard, I'll just put it out there now, has the dual effect and really nice effect of identifying bad addresses that exist on the current checklist before we take the step in September of mailing ballots to everybody. So when clerks get the undeliverables or the forwardable notices back from the post office, whatever format that takes, it's gonna move us a long way toward cleaning up the addresses that need to be cleaned up on the checklist. Again, in combination with those postcards, um, the whole summer, we would engage in a big voter education campaign to say request your ballot because we're not sending it in this instance and return it by mail. And what is everybody's interest across both elections is let's remove, let's reduce traffic at the polling places as much as possible to reduce risk to voters and poll workers. It's really, uh, it's really important. I don't say that lightly. I know everybody has been seeing the developing stories coming from elections that have been held nationwide, um, putting poll workers and voters at risk of this virus, contracting this virus. Um, I got ahead of my notes a little bit because I mentioned at the beginning that of course, then there are all of the other TBDs to be determined, which are those processing allowances I was talking about on either sides of election day for the clerks and poll workers. All of those would be with the intent of not having to deal with the giant influx of absentee ballots that we're going to see for both elections all at the same time and in the same cramped time frames that they typically have to deal with absentee ballots, which typically wouldn't be of this volume. And we got to consider that asking five, 10, six poll workers to be in a room processing ballots presents its own risks. And so how can we extend those processing times and or modify that process to reduce the risk to poll workers, the amount of contact they have to have with each other and ballots. Um, the other to be determined decisions are rules of conduct around the polling places. Um, whether we might allow drive up voting, 
whether we might allow these polling places to be outside, what the appropriate distancing rules are. Those decisions can be made later and can be based on um, more direct knowledge of how bad the virus is at either of the given election times. And also because of our, our well-designed election management system, we will have a day-to-day -day notice of how many ballots have been returned. And we're gonna have a good idea of how much traffic is left over, how many ballots we haven't seen as we get closer to the election and can adjust accordingly. That's the basic outline proposal for the two elections for the processes. One other thing that we might, another to be determined, I just give you guys some of the ideas that are still in the background and out there. Um, whether in the general election, if we're sending a ballot to every voter and putting it under their nose, whether we um, develop a system of some kind of Dropbox, secure Dropbox locations where ballots can be returned to. Um, that's proven really effective in a lot of other areas of the country as another mode of return um, to ensure that people do so. That would be an investment, of course, and we would talk about where and, and security is the main concern with those drop boxes, of course. Um, I'll just touch on, because I think it's going to be a question, and I might as well affirmatively address it right now, which is um, what's driving the timing? and what's driving the need to make the decision now. Um, there are a number of things. Uh, from a broad perspective, people who know election administration and who know the implementation of a vote by mail system would think that it's nearly crazy to try and do so between now and September. Having said that, because everybody knows the dilemma and the challenge we're faced with, there are resources being marshaled across the country to try and help um, states stand up these new processes um, in a very short amount of time. So to be more specific, the, the, I think the biggest, the biggest couple drivers are a mailing house contract to be put in place and systems put in place with that mailing house to be ready to do this very complex mailing in September. Um, these are details on the numbers, how many ballots they're gonna be putting together into envelopes, how many envelopes they're gonna need, what are the size of those envelopes to have the best insertion process, the most efficient insertion process. Um, very big one is just, just the quantity of envelopes and ballots that needs to be printed. If we're gonna mail a ballot to every voter in November, you need to account for 100% of the checklist, right, that you mail the ballots to. Then you need to also have backup ballots for people who may request them after that time, register and request them, or miss the ballot and want another. And you need additional ballots for any um, election day traffic. So we're talking about instead of our typical order of 100% of your checklist for the general election, probably 125%. Same thing with the primary. We want to we want to pad the primary so that clerks have enough for more absentee balloting and potential voters at the polling place and just the kind of very minor detail that goes into this if we're going to be mailing the ballot to all voters in um, september for november we would want to do what they call scoring a lot more of those ballots which allows them to be folded easily by the mailing house folders and fit in the certificate envelope coming back if you're not going to be mailing them all out we typically only score about 30 percent anticipating that kind of absentee volume I was on a phone call uh, at, from about 10 to 11 this morning with the envelope printers, the ballot printers, the US Postal Service, and they will be placing orders for their ballot stock for November next week. Those are the kind of things that are driving the timing on this. They would have liked to place those earlier. Um, just one other example of the actual design of the envelopes. We want to have a common design between um, August and November for pricing reasons and consistency reasons for the mailing house. And so we need to develop, apply for the correct permitting and prepaid postage to be applying to all of those envelopes um, right now in the next couple of weeks. So there's a lot of kind of low level, just nitty gritty detail stuff that's driving the timing. And then I think you can all appreciate that 
um, there is a very high level of anxiety right now among the clerks as to what the process is going to be so that they can start preparing for it mentally and, and every other way. Um, there's, there's anxiety among the voters about what the election process is going to be in the fall. Um, and as soon as possible, we want to be able to communicate that out and start educating folks about what they can expect all year. Um, so I think that really drives the timing as well. And I think with that, I'll stop and open it up to questions. So um, right before we go to questions here, and Sarah, if you can keep track of people here too, when hands go up, because I can't see everybody, if we can do that together. Yep. I but I just w wanted to say that um, we, in our committee, we've been hearing from um, vulnerable communities around many different issues. Uh, we, our committee was kind of assigned this funneling um, activity and Will has been working with um, a, with the vulnerable communities out there, the elderly, the community of color, new Americans, translating. He's been really, really working hard um, with those communities. And the second thing I'm gonna say is that on Thanksgiving day this year, Will and the town clerks can probably all just have a really restful day because this will all be done. And I, <laughs> and I just have great confidence that it will be done well, so. Adam. So that's a long time for poor Will to wait to uh, be able to take a deep breath and rest. I know, I, I, I know it is. <laughs> Why they pay Brian? me the big bucks. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Brian? Well, I saw Paul? Chris Winter's hand up too. Oh, okay, I didn't see that. Did you want to add something before I ask a question, Chris? Oh, you're frozen. He's frozen. <laughs> Great view. That's a good freeze. Okay, I'll go ahead and ask my question. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, Will, I'm wondering from where you're obtaining the list you're using in August to invite people to request that absentee ballot. Our voter registration database. Okay. I was under the impression that even if someone isn't registered to vote, they would be getting this invitation. Is that not true? That's not my current proposal, but it could be an option. Okay. What, what, how, what do you mean? If they aren't registered to vote? They would need to be given an option to register and request. Yeah, there, there, there still will be election day registration, right? I assume so. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Representative Harrison has a question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Will, thank you for um, the overview. I have a couple of questions. Um, the primary plan, as I understand it, you sending out the postcards um, has a lot of merit. Um, and like you said, in terms of correcting address and stuff, um, but on that line, what happens if someone's moved and they're no longer at that address? Does the postcard get returned to the town, to the state, or does it get forward to their new address? I mean, in some cases, I guess they could live in the same town, different address, uh, or in some cases, other cases, they could have moved out of state. And obviously, we want to make sure they're off or if they've moved to another town we want to make sure that they're registered in the new town not the old town it's a good it's a good question and one that i'm still working on i'm learning that i think there's a couple options you either just get a non-deliverable notice back to the clerk or you get a forwarding where it's forwarded to a new address i think and there are, there are pluses and minuses to both of those, but I think if you were to do the forwarding, there's an option and you would certainly want it where the clerk gets a notice of that forwarded address so that the check can be updated with the address it was forwarded to. Okay, so if, if um, you sent out the postcard to Jim Harrison at my address and I had moved uh, down the street, um, if it was forwarded, would you even know? I think there's an option where the clerk is. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, um, that's helpful. And I would want that if we were going to forward. That's the whole point. Right. Now, if we are in a mail ballot, and I'm not sure, quite frankly, how the, um, although the absentees now are requested and you have to give them your current address when you request it. Um, so it's probably not an issue, but um, if you were mailing a ballot, whether it's for the primary or in the fall for the general election, what happens in that case if you move? Does it just end up in the hands of the new occupants of that dwelling? Uh, does it get forwarded or does it get returned because they're not at the address that you had on file? It's another good question. I think my approach there would be to have it returned to the clerk. Okay. You, you mentioned um, something about prepaid postage. Is this the return envelope? Yep, both ways. Okay, does that currently happen on absentee ballots? No. Okay. Um, so if it's prepaid- uh, Rep. Harrison, sorry. Yes. I believe some towns and cities put postage on them and some don't, it's up to them. Okay, but in this case, the state would be doing it. Correct. So would the ballots go back to the state or to the town? Town. Okay. Um, does it have to come back in that envelope? In what case are you talking about where it was undelivered? Well, I'm, I'm just, you know, you know, over the years, we've gravitated to more and more early voting. Um, yep. And in a lot of cases, that's probably been helpful and productive. But if we're going to dramatically increase that, obviously there's a greater opportunity for uh, returns that are fraudulent, um, you know, for a number of reasons. I mean, that can happen today, but, you know, we're, we're sort of increasing that. And I'm, I'm wondering if, um, you know, with the prepaid postage envelope, there's some standardization if it's addressed to the town clerk. Um, I'm just wondering if- I think I've got, I think I've got your question. Yes. Okay. And within the return, the, the, the envelope that's gonna be returned in the mail, that has the clerk's address pre-printed on it for the voter and his postage paid. Before that step, the voter puts the ballot in what we call the certificate envelope. Okay. Signed and dated by the voter and the, their name is printed. There's, a, there's an extensive certificate language that says, I am a voter in this town. I am the one who voted this ballot. I was not influenced in voting this ballot and I am signing this certificate under awareness that I'm doing so under the penalty of perjury. That certificate envelope is put in the mailer that's pre-addressed back to the clerk. Okay. Last election cycle, there was a well-publicized case in, I think it was North Carolina, where a congressional uh, election was ruled invalid um, because a third party, um, intercepted a number of the ballots, uh, supposedly, uh, and returned them directly as opposed to going through the normal process. Is that allowed currently under Vermont law? Um, and if it is, is that something we should consider changing? I'm not sure what you're asking is allowed or not, but what was engaged in in North Carolina was highly criminal behavior. They were prosecuted for and okay. we considered so here as well. And they would be prosecuted for it. And I just think um, the other comment there is in the, you know, my eight years and Secretary Condos 10 years, we've seen no evidence of that kind of activity in Vermont. Okay, so if I am going door to door doing my campaigning, can I collect ballots? No. I'm I'm asking. I I've never I've never obviously done that, but I'm asking, can I? Is that yes. against Vermont law? I I, I want to be sure about my answer to that, Rep. Harrison. Can I get back to you? Yeah, no, I just I think it's something we need to ask um, because of trying to do various town meetings this year 
uh, where many of us go to four or five different town meetings. Um, yep. uh, I filled out my ballot because I couldn't be in my town on town meeting day because I was over in Bridgewater. Um, but I filled out my ballot, um, signed it, put it in the envelope, and I think I gave it to my wife to drop off. Um, I assumed that that was okay. Um, certainly it was accepted by our town clerk, um, but um, if, I, if she could do it for me, does that mean I could do it for others? I'm, I don't wanna do that. And I think that opens up a whole bunch of questions. I'm just asking if that's something we should consider. I believe in the case, it can be returned on your behalf by someone else. Um, the important point is that it's signed by you on mm -hmm. the certificate envelope. And that's the criminal behavior I was talking about in, in North Carolina. They weren't just returning people's ballots for them. They were, my understanding is throwing some away and in other cases, voting them and signing on behalf of voters. Okay, no, I, and, and I get it. It's a little bit of a different scenario, but might it be something we consider if we're going to do a different election process this year? And maybe you can do that in the emergency powers that we gave the secretary's office with the election. Um, just throwing that out there as a question. We all want to increase participation, but we want also decrease any potential for fraud. And on that line, have you looked at other states to find out, some states I guess do voting by mail. Um, and I don't know um, what security procedures, whether they use tracking numbers or any of those procedures that have we looked at uh, and considered? The, yeah, the, the every, it's, it's, it's um, central to the discussion of implementing these systems. And it's just been over time, highly proven to be an infinitesimal amount of activity of that kind of um, election fraud. It, frankly, it's kind of hard to imagine the benefit that somebody would see versus the risk they are taking in the criminal activity they'd be um, undertaking. And I think that's precisely why we don't see it happen. There are way better ways to um, influence the outcome of an election than engage in criminal absentee ballot fraud. Okay, thank you. Representative Cannon has a question. Okay, good, I'm glad you could see him. Thank you. Um, so, so Will, um, have there been any voter fraud cases in Vermont involving mail ballots? Not during my time, Rep. Gannon. Okay. And I assume you've done the research. I mean, you know, this whole myth about voter fraud and mail-in ballots, I think, is a myth. Um, there, there are very few instances of that. Is that correct? Very few is an understatement. And do you believe within, um, what is it, uh, Act 92, you have the, the powers that the Secretary of State needs to put into place any procedures um, to ensure um, that there is no fraud um, if we did move to a mail-in process? I do. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Committee members with hands up, but I um, I know that Chris Winters had uh, tried to jump in a bit ago, and maybe Chris wants to jump in at this point. Oh, there he is. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope you all can hear me. This is the first time my internet's had a really, really real problem um, on one of these calls. So hopefully uh, you can hear me and I'll stay yeah. heard. I appreciate it. I just want to, in the beginning, I'm Sorry, it was really bad time. I don't know if it's um, me or you, I, I but just you're going to say that no, it's not working. It's not working. Despite Will's very calm demeanor here, 
him turn off his video. Chris, can you hear us? Oh, your video. Oh. Yeah, just take again. your video off. All right, I'll do that. And just speak. Is that better? Can everybody yes. hear? Okay, sorry again. Um, I, I was trying to say thank you for what you did and putting the law that you did into, into Act 92 and giving us the, the flexibility and the authority to act quickly. And really time is of the essence here. So despite Will's calm demeanor here, he is under the gun. We all are every single day working on this. Um, and so I, you know, I appreciate your, your questions today, but I wanted to emphasize how much we are running out of time and we are running out of runway to get this plane off the ground. Um, so we need to make decisions yesterday about vote by mail. Um, and I do wanna say that the governor's team has really been great. They have um, kept the politics out of it. I know they're really busy and they have so many other things to do. So we appreciate their time um, and they're being careful about this, but we need a decision soon and we don't have an agreement with them yet. We were hoping for a meeting with the governor's team, uh, with the governor between the secretary of state and the governor today, um, but we have not been able to get that. So we hope it's gonna happen soon and we hope to have a decision for you. Our goal all along has been to make a decision on this by the end of the month. Um, so we hope that we can um, make that as soon as possible next week. Um, so, and just, you know, the only other thing that I wanted to mention is, uh, that it would not be possible for us to do uh, a vote by mail for the August primary because of the short window, uh, because all of the burden of doing that would land on the clerks. Um, so in case anyone has any questions still about whether we can do the same process for August and for November, um, that's one of the big uh, factors as to why we're doing that. So just to you know, bottom line it, um, we are the um, election experts. Will is obviously the biggest election expert here, and uh, we hope that you rely on us with the power that you've given us, and we hope that the governor's team is going to rely on us soon uh, and get us to a place where we can move forward with a clear direction. Thank you. Thanks. I think that one thing that Will um, talked about here um, is important to remember and important uh, for the everybody involved in making the decisions is that there are a bunch of questions that can be answered later around things like um, mailing back and forth and how we do that and polling place procedures and extended processing time and those kinds of questions. So I think it's really important that we'll keep that list and that everybody understand that we don't have to answer every single question now. What we need to answer now is kind of the, the basic way it's going to happen and so that we can get these printed and when you said that you had hoped to make this decision by the end of the month you did not mean by the end of may it is now may you meant by the end of april right absolutely right by the end of april will is already moving as though um because he has to out of necessity yeah. he's making plans now we are yeah. planning for a worst case scenario and the problem is we don't know what it's going to look like in August or yeah. in November. And even today in the governor's press conference, he was talking about a resurgence in September and October. So it's, it's imperative that we start moving on this right now. Uh, Brian? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Brian. Chair. So we've talked a little bit about the merits of the two-stage process for the primary election. And I'm, I think Chris was trying to answer it, but maybe I'm just not understanding if that's to be a, a good sort of procedure to follow in August, why wouldn't it also be a good procedure in November? The, the mailing of just a request instead of the mailing a ballot to everybody. Yes, the postcard first saying you can now get an absentee ballot if you fill this out and mail it back. You want to get that, Will, or you want me to answer it? I, I can start at least, Chris, and feel like you think I miss anything. Um, it's a good question, Senator Collimore. We talked about it, I think, in both of the previous committee meetings a little bit. Um, I can see the interest in a consistent process between the two elections. Um, I acknowledge that the reason that I'm suggesting what I'm suggesting 
is that they're two very different elections. Um, we expect, we see normally about three times as many voters at the general election, 20, 25% for the primary to 60, 75% for the general. Um, I anticipate that to be at least the case this year. Um, people are very tuned in to the November general election, care a lot about it. People are far less tuned in to our August statewide primary and way less about it. It's just the truth. Um, so when you, you think about the effectiveness, how, how it's going to help you to mail a ballot and put it under the nose of every voter with a return envelope back to the clerk, I think it's going to have a much more significant impact on the number of voters at the polls in November than it would have in August. The 20 to 25 percent of the Vermonters who typically participate in August are the type of engaged voters that will request the ballot. And especially if prompted with the postcard. The electorate in um, November are not the same kind of engaged voters, are more likely to one miss that postcard or um, not, not be as likely to take the two step process of requesting, getting it mailed to them, and mailing it back. Um, the, the basic point, though, is that when you expect so much more traffic at the polls in November, you take additional steps to reduce that traffic even more than you would in August. Um, there's a couple of, of, of practical reasons why too. The, the um, cleaning up of the mailing list through the postcard, as I said this summer, so that the, the mailing, if we were to mail it in for all voters in August, in June, there wouldn't be that opportunity to do the address cleanup beforehand and we get a lot more back. You got to remember that for the August primary, you're mailing three ballots to every voter. And you've got to have two unvoted returned and one voted returned in the certificate envelope or it's defective. So it's, it's a much more detailed process also in August too that doesn't lend itself as much to sending all three of those ballots to every registered voter. Um, August is a primary it's a nominating process. You're not electing anybody to office. The sort of choice that people are put up against is less significant in August than November in terms of their, their exercise of their right to vote. And that's borne out by the different levels in turnout in the two elections. If I can just add one thing to that, that um, I think that one of the reasons people are more interested and more people vote in November than in August is because that is really a party function. The August um, election is the parties figuring out who their nominee is going to be. And many, many, many people in Vermont consider themselves independents and don't, don't take part in what they consider a party function. So I, I think that there's a huge difference there between the two elections. Yeah, I think Will covered it well and Senator mm -hmm. White as well. Um, the only other point that I would raise is that if we go to a, a re ballot by request system in November with a, an expectedly huge turnout, um, we'll have a lot of requests and those are all going to fall onto the town clerks. Um, some of them will be able to handle that very well, but others may very well be overwhelmed by such a large number of absentee ballot requests and processing. Representative LeClaire has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, Will and Chris have both said that there's things that, that have to be done immediately. And I know Will ticked off a few things, but I'm just curious, could you be a, a little more specific about the things that have to be done, say, by the end of this month? Um, are we talking about securing vendors and uh, prepaying for their, their supplies? What, what, what's causing it, the, the sense of urgency? Because like Jeanette had said, it seems like there's, there's a lot of questions that are going to have to be answered as we go. It seems a little bit like building an airplane as we're flying mm. it, but what's it... I got everything up to building an airplane and while we're flying it. So I'll answer that. <laughs> You're right, uh, Representative Leclerc. It is, I, I will try to be clear. I mean, the main things are, are 
stock, appropriate stock for envelopes and ballots and vendor contracting for the statewide mailing um, in September. But again, you know, why why wait? But but when you um, emphasize the end of the month, if we waited until the end of May to make that decision um, to get a contract and make sure that we had the um, mailing house contract and the printing, um, all the materials. That's a little late, is it not? I mean, aren't you talking about how, that some states have already signed their contracts and put in their requests? Yes, that's too late already. There, there are vendors who have told me that they have no more capacity for, for certain kinds of these services. You need to get in line now. Um, it's a really crazy situation out there. Mm -hmm. The election vendor community is really small. Um, and they're, they're stretched to their capacity right now to handle this crisis. But I tried, you know, actually, and it was Rep LeClaire who raised this question, I think, last time we were talking, that I'm also really making an effort for a couple reasons to keep the, ven the vendors local on this process as much as possible. Um, one, because I just think that's a good idea, and two, because they have a, a more intimate knowledge of our process here. So I'm actually trying to work with some of the existing folks who print ballots for us to also perform the mailing services. And of course, that makes it more seamless. You don't have to have somebody print the ballots and then mail them across the country to another person who puts them all together and sends them back to every voter in Vermont. So it, it's arranging all of those relationships getting all of the supplies in order and getting the, the ability to put it all together in September together, which is your mailing house vendor or vendors. Senator Bray has a question. Yeah, I guess this is for uh, Will and Chris, or um, I know we all uh, have shared goals around having a well-managed, well-run, uh, secure election. And um, I'd hate to think that logistics uh, would jeopardize that a little bit. So I'm curious as to whether or not you've been given any kind of date certain by which you will receive a reply from the um, uh, administration uh, in terms of signing off um, on the proposal you have. I can take that, Will. Um, we have not. Uh, we, we've been talking to them all along about trying to make a decision by the end of the month, by the end of the month of April. Uh, we've been requesting uh, a sit down between the Secretary of State and the Governor, and we understand he's very busy and that hasn't happened yet. We, we, we would hope to have a decision right after that. I think Will's of the opinion, we need to do this as soon as possible. We need an agreement, we need a directive, we need to move forward next week at the latest. And then just, just one other thing that I'll, that I'll bring up um, is that uh, through this process, the governor's team has suggested that maybe we need to come back to the legislature for further approval in the form of a bill or a resolution uh, for whatever action we take. I'll just let, let the committees know that we vehemently oppose that. We think you've already given us the authority to do what we're proposing now, which is vote by mail. Vote by mail is explicitly listed as one of the options in Act 92. Um, and we don't want to slow this process down anymore. So we've been very much opposed to, uh, no offense, opposed to bringing anything back to the legislature. We think you've already done uh, a, a good job in putting the, the, the necessary procedure and power in place for us to make a decision and get moving. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. Okay. Senator well, Clarkson. You. Well, I, can I just follow oh, briefly? The, yep. uh, I know that, you know, when we discussed the language, it, the, it was in consultation with, was the original language, and then it was amended to an agreement with in order to um, broadcast an even stronger commitment to bipartisanship and comedy. Um, but I, I, I think that was also based on the notion that we would have um, a timely response. So 
if, you know, I'm wondering if the two committee chairs, for instance, may not want to um, say something officially on behalf of a, a sense on the part of these two committees that we're aware of there being pressure on the Secretary of State's office to run the election well, which again, I'd say I'd come back, we all agree to that. And maybe it's not um, as um, high a priority as we would all hope as government operations folks uh, on the administration's to-do list at the moment. Senator Clarkson. I, I, was, I was gonna say exactly the same uh, thing. I was gonna say maybe it, uh, maybe it's time for uh, Sarah and Jeanette to write a letter on behalf and support our our support of our own our own action and uh, and moving ahead in a timely fashion and underscoring what we've already done. Thank you. On the screws. Representative Harrison has his hand up. Okay, I didn't hear. Okay. Yeah. Um, Obviously, the committee chairs can do what they like. I'm just uncomfortable getting in the middle of those conversations with the governor and secretary of state. I think they're both reasonable people and they will do what's best for Vermont. Um, there may be some disagreement over when you need to pull different triggers um, between now and November. Uh, and I think Will's very smart to have a plan ready in place. It could mean we end up printing some ballots that we don't end up sending out. Um, so be it. Um, but um, I think uh, the August primary, we're going to learn a lot about the new process. I think we're going to help clean up our voter checklist. And uh, I think he's very smart in the way he's uh, outlined that. Um, but whether we send ballots to everyone um, in September, um, right now, um, we could certainly make plans to get them printed. Um, but, you know, we could say postage if we don't send them and don't need them. So. Um, I, I'm just, I'm not comfortable sending a letter, um, but um, again, we're all individuals, so if the committee chairs choose to do it, they certainly can. I, if I can throw up as a chair, one of the chairs here, I think that the, um, and I think Representative Harrison, you just um, put your finger on it, the decision needs to be made about the printing and the, um, and a mailing house contract. If in November, we find that they have figured out a, um, a vaccine and a cure and everything else and we don't need to, to do this, then we probably don't need to do it. But if we come to September and we don't have any ballots printed, we're up the proverbial creek. So I think the decision is whether we go ahead now and get them print, as I understand it, Will, that we go ahead now, assuming that we're going to have, that we're going to do it that way in November and get them printed and get some kind of a contract. Am I wrong? I think it would be a, a very unwise wait until the end of the summer to decide to mail a ballot to every voter. And let me tell yeah. you, Okay. If we do so, I won't be able to do it through a mailing house. You will be asking the clerks to send the ballot to every voter at that point. And the other so piece, you need to have a contract for both the printing and the mailing out. And do a lot of legwork over the next three months, yeah. making sure that process is, is that is a very precise process. 275 different ballot styles and 246 yeah. different return addresses. Each voter needs a particular ballot style, one of those 275, and a particular return address. Not all voters with the same return address to the clerk have the same ballot style. Towns and cities that are split by districts, and so people in the same town or city vote on a different ballot. It's a massive coordination to make sure that you get, it's 246 different runs of envelopes, and then I put it's a massive data coordination that needs significant preparation over the summer. The other way you can do it is to just what you're talking about. I print enough ballots and envelopes to account for it. And we at some point tell the clerks that, okay, you're going to send three weeks yeah. of the ballot to every registered voter. Forget it. Forget I ever said that. 
it's the, the only other piece of this that I would that I would add is the sooner we can make a decision on which direction we are going in August and November, the sooner we can start getting the word out. We can start educating voters, let people know what to expect, uh, so that we don't have any confusion come August and November. But all those other issues, like whether there will be drop boxes and whether there'll be polling places and what the rules will be for the polling places and all of that doesn't have to be done next week. That That is information that you will keep working on until the, with the town clerks until the election. Is that right? That's right. And okay. In a lot of ways to me, those are more sort of upsetting decisions to the process. I have a hard time, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not do, proposing any real deviation from the norm except sending a ballot to everybody and putting it under their nose. They're going to return it in the same way. It's going to be processed by the clerks in the same way. It's to me, it's sort of not a. a I shouldn't say that, but it's not a hard decision to make because all you're doing is sending a ballot to everybody. You're not forcing everybody to vote it. You're just trying to take what is proven to be the best step that you can take to have people return and vote their ballots by mail, which I think is what we all want. We want to reduce traffic at the polling places. That's our common interest. We're, we're, we've been asked what the best way to do that is, and this is my strong feeling that that's the best way to do it. And we can really only practically carry it out if we make the decision now, and certainly we can only do it well by making the decision now. Thank you, Will. Representative Hooper has a question. Uh, more probably an inappropriate statement. Um, I think contrary to what Jim said, we already have stuck ourselves in the middle of it by taking the exclusive power away from the person that's responsible for elections and dividing it. The uh, question kind of is, if we go ahead with printing and everything else up to the point and it doesn't come off that way, do we run jeopardy of being stuck with the cost for all this stuff from the money that has come in specifically for that or is it big latitude on where we can spend it on and not use it well we would be stuck to pay any cost that we contracted for and incurred that's for sure i can't well yeah but you you, a, I, you said there was going to be you know we'd be able to use the federal money for this and if we spend the money but don't use it for the intended purpose do they do we then get stuck with it if we print 630,000 ballots or whatever. You know, that's a good point and, and that's probably the case. Well, that's a big issue, I think, in a time when we're scraping and it should be a big issue for the governor too. I certainly support the chairs going forward with a, hey, let's get this moving idea. Thank you. I don't see anybody else. Do you, Sarah? Uh, Harrison and Hooper both still have their- Oh, and Anthony, Anthony I see too. Up, but- um, Senator, who, who did you see? Uh, Senator Polina. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, this, this will be brief. I just, I, I also wanna um, encourage you to write a letter to the governor. And, it's not as if we're sticking our nose in it and saying this is how we want it to happen. The letter, purpose of the letter is simply to say we need you to agree to something as soon as possible. Not, not trying to dictate what that would be, but just making it clear that we need an agreement as soon as possible. And I think that could be a pretty simple letter just expressing our concerns that there are decisions that have to be made regardless of what they are. All right, Senator Colomar. So <clears throat> I'm gonna agree with uh, Representative Harrison probably not a big surprise. Um, I, when we started the discussion today, Will made it clear that these were just proposals, that no decision had yet been made. And I supported what we passed two or three weeks back because I felt that there was a give and take situation with your office, Will, and the administration. And so I think by pushing this letter, um, and that's fine if that's what people wanna do, you are, in essence, asking the governor to agree to the two proposals. I see the two elections as being very different. I'm not as much 
concerned about the primary election in terms of whatever people might think mischief could occur or could not occur. My focus is more on the general election. So if, if the administration would agree to your proposal, Will, for the August cycle, it might allow at least a little bit more time to come back and figure out how we want to mm. approach the November election. Absolutely. If Chris wants to field that one or not, um, I would point out just one point I would make, Senator Collins, there, there would be no action needed for what I'm proposing for August. I, I thought that um, part of the reason for having to make the decision quickly was for the November election, because that's when we need to have the contracts for the with the mailing houses and the printers. We yes. don't need to have do that for the August election because that isn't gonna be that much different than it has in the past. <clears throat> so you're gonna print, I don't, I don't know how many val ballots you print for that, but you're gonna do it the same way you always do. Is it, am I wrong? As a matter of law, yeah, right. We might order a little more, but that's, we don't need a directive to say what quantity of envelopes and ballots we can order. So do we know here what, um, if there is, um, if it's just a matter of that the, first of all, I think that people who aren't involved in elections ha, don't really understand the, the work that it takes up front before an election to make sure the election is done and when you need to make decisions. And it's um, Chris Bray, Senator Bray is always fond of saying it's like um, the airplane on the tarmac. You, there's, a, there's a point at which you need to decide you're going to leave and go up. And I think that for people who aren't involved in elections, they would be stunned to know that the point that you have to make that decision is so much earlier than the election itself. So I guess my question is just, is it, is it um, a question of difference of opinion or just not, just the fact that the, the governor and his staff are so busy dealing with um, when people should, when things should reopen and um, UI and all of that stuff that this seems so far away that, I, I mean, is there, do you sense that there's actual disagreement or that it's just that it hasn't uh, uh, risen to that priority yet? So or don't I'll, you Senator, know? Yeah, this is, this is Chris Winters. I, I'd say we don't know, um, I, I think, uh, what we really need is for the Secretary of State and the Governor to have a conversation, and that's, mm -hmm. that's why we've been asking about that. We've spent a long time uh, and a lot of time talking about all the details and all the intricacies of trying to get a vote by mail election off the ground. So a lot of our our meetings with staff, we've been meeting with the Governor's team one or two times a week for the last I don't know month now. Um, oh. And so we've, we've taken a lot of time to bring folks up, up to speed on the, the ins and outs of elections, which is, there's a lot to it. And um, you know, Will is the one to, to do that. And he's done a great job of that, but it comes to a point where I think the secretary um, needs to sit with the governor and, and get this final decision made. And um, like I said, we've had a really great experience with the governor's team. They are working so hard on so many things. We appreciate that their time is valuable. And uh, we just hope that if the secretary and the governor can get in a room together, they can figure this out and we can get a decision. Actually not in a room together, in a virtual room, I should say. <laughs> Well, I appreciate the time that um, that you have spent with us today, helping us understand all of the planning that's going into preparations for August and November. Um, and uh, you know, I I can't help but think that if we had known four or five months ago that our Department of Labor was going to get the kind of traffic it's gotten over the past six weeks, uh, we might have been more urgently preparing for that. And so I appreciate that the Secretary of State's office 
is working diligently to make sure that they are preparing for uh, a different way of executing elections, uh, given that it's not safe at this moment to uh, to count on in-person voting. So thank you for uh, for doing this legwork, and I certainly hope that this comes to a, a quick resolution so that you can move forward with making the preparations you need to make. Thank you, Madam Chair. We we really appreciate that. We've been working with you know the simple goal of making sure no one has to choose between their their health and safety and their right to vote. We don't want to disenfranchise anybody. We want to make everybody comfortable with voting in August and November. Uh, and based on all the information that Will has gathered, we really believe uh, that this is the path forward. This is the way to ensure that the most people get to vote, aren't afraid to vote, and we also protect the poll workers and the folks who visit the polling places. Well, I noticed that Secretary Condos has joined the meeting. Okay, I'm going to have uh, if we give him a few minutes and then um, I think your Senate GovOps committee is going to, you have another meeting, right? So are you gonna keep on on this one and we'll just leave and go off on our all Senate meeting? Is that the way you wanna do this? Sarah? We have a separate Zoom meeting set up for us to, to jump onto as soon as we're done here. Um, oh. That meeting is uh, set to start in three minutes. Um, okay. We certainly want to stay and finish this here with you, and then we'll all peel off and go do our meeting. And then I would suggest to, uh, to our committee that we don't really have time to, if we're, do we want to join the all Senate caucus and put off until next week the um, municipal boards? Because we don't have time to do both. We can't uh, do I justice. I, I think we should go and do the all Senate. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's let's um, let Senator uh, Senator Secretary Condos, um, if you have a word with us, and then and then we'll leap off into our different meetings. Are you there? I don't think he was hearing us. Hey, I'm here. Oh, oh good. It's. So we're leaving you in about three minutes here. Did you have something you wanted to share with us? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. There's 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 some kind of uh, yeah, uh, overlapping going on. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Go ahead. Okay, well, if you have something you want to share with us, you better do it because we're all leaving in about two minutes and a half minutes. All right, so, so. so the, the, issue, the issue here, the issue here. Um, everything's delayed. Something's that's going on. You have your live stream going at the same time, do you? Um, I think <laughs> I Secretary think Condos, I think you are the one that is causing the overlap and the delay. We aren't sure why. Okay, how about that? Is that better? That yeah. is much better. All right. <laughs> Let me see where I am here. You don't need to see yourself. Okay. So so okay. in any case, the 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 issue I think that, that uh, we're missing is, uh, as Will said, we have to make a decision. We really have to make a decision next week. Um, the, the governor's team was suggesting that we come back to the legislature to get their approval of this concept before it goes back to the governor. And we said, you already did that. that that's yeah. what Act 92 was about, was, was to do that. Um, and we don't need to go back to the legislature because to try to get a resolution or another bill out of the legislature is probably going to be several weeks before we can do that. So in any case, I think, um, you know, the only idea of the letter was to perhaps send a letter saying we've already debated this issue. This was part of the concept was that we might go this direction uh, and then have, um, 
uh, just send a letter to the governor's team so that they understand that, uh, that this was contemplated by the legislature. Uh, and, and we really need to get, get moving on this because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, and if we were to try to do, to drive down the numbers of people in person in November, by doing again another ballot request card, uh, that whole process will fall onto the town clerk office. And to put it bluntly, I think they would probably riot. Um, I, I, I don't think that they would be ready to deal with that many ballot requests um, uh, coming out of their offices. That I, and, I, and that's the whole idea of it this way is is to try to get this contracts in place to get mm -hmm. data uh, driven stuff that has to be done completed yep. so that we can complete the work that we need to do. If we wait until after the primary decisions, it's too late. This whole process will fall to the clerks. Uh, and I don't think they're gonna be very happy. Um, so in any case, uh, you know, I, I, we're here to just kind of give you guys an update uh, and that's our goal is to give you an update um, and just let you know. And if you, if you decide you want to send a letter to the governor, it's not interfering. It's just saying to them that you don't need to do, take any further action at the legislative level. Right. And I think that we did talk about that a little bit earlier. Um, there didn't seem to be any um, disagreement about that. So I'm going to, um, since you guys are past your start time, and we are also, I'm going to apologize to Carol Doss, who has been on this call listening to us, and um, to Tucker and to Gwyn, who thought that we were going to be actually dealing with um, one of the issues, I think, of their um, BCA appeals and other quasi judicial municipal boards. And I really apologize to you, but we did not know we were gonna have this 2.30 meeting. So we will schedule it again um, for early next week. My apologies. Thank you to the Secretary of State's office for making time yes. for this meeting today and uh, welcome House uh, Government Operations members to peel off of this meeting and check your legislative email for the invite for the 215 meeting that we are past time for. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for joining us and us joining you.